Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are, and welcome, Aka Fleischer. Yes, hello. And me, Sheni Hichnas. Darmar bin Besim. So happy, finally. Oh, me, Sheni, me, Sheni, 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 Hichnas Adar. Wow. Yep, we've entered the 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 double month of Adar yes. this year. It is it is the, it shows the wisdom uh, of our great sages that when they had to intercalate the months, they had to what? Yeah, add a month uh. in order to match up the sun and the moon because we 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 want to show the love between the sun and the moon, and they have a little bit of a different calendar in order to match them up. We intercalate. I think that's the pronunciation. Uh, the month um, really quite quite a. It happens quite often uh, that a year will have 13 uh, lunar months because another month is added. And so uh, our, our our wise sages or our sage wise people, men, um, added uh, the month of Adar, the happy month. We don't have two Avs, even though, you know, some of us are Hungarian or whatever it is. We, we do not do an extra month of worrying hey. or an extra month of, we don't have an extra this month of. This is not, what is this? This is microaggression against no, Hungarian people. I just mean to say that within us, all of us is a little Hungarian as well. Like you, like I'm just saying, we all have. Why do you have to go there? We have Jewish nervousness. That's all yes. I mean. We have Jewish nervousness, Jewish guilt. Keeps Jewish us alive. Shuva, that's right. Jewish repentance, Jewish, all that stuff. But the, but the rabbis could have been like, you people need an extra month of repentance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here's no, another. Like, no, 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 no. Here's no, no. another LOL in your face. Yeah. Right? Another like, LOL, ah. I need that. Or here's another preparation month for Pesach. Clean yeah. some more. Scrub oh, away, Jews. That sounds rough. Right. No. So instead Although of. Although like, I like Nissan. Hey, Nissan's great. And LOL's great. And LOL's great. great. I love LOL. And it's great to be alive. Yeah. But the rabbis, in their kindness, were like, or in their wisdom, I think, were like, nah. Nah, nah. You we need, need, we need a you little need more month happy, of, of joy. You need a juice. month of joy. And and this is a very important thing. We have 60 days of joy. Wait, Isha, you know, I just have to say, I didn't interrupt you for a second. Go ahead now. Um, in one of our WhatsApp groups, um, somebody shared this like most hilarious forward about like sentences that only Jews understand. Right. And that non-Jews cannot understand. Right. <clears throat> so one of them, and there were a lot, and they were really, really funny. And one of them is like, what does it mean that Rosh Hashanah is coming out late this year? Right. Like, how can a holiday... Be late. Be late. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So yeah, we have two months of Adar. Right. Well, pushing the calendar back a little bit. You're right. But what's really interesting about, about Judaism, I think, is that really we have uh, the solar year of the Gregorian, the Christian world, the, right. the Western world. And we have an Eastern calendar as well, which is a lunar calendar. Right, and we coordinate them. We coordinate them, and I think that's so cool. Big fan. Uh, I, big I always, fan. I always, big fan. I, big fan. Uh, I always wish I understood it even better, a little bit how the moon exactly. Like there are there are Jews that really understand like the whole thing about how the moon spins around and exactly when it matches. It just they're good with the numbers and the math. They're, they're the people who like baseball, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, sure. Um, stats people. Stats people. And and I have a book here written by actually our uh, uh, our, our dermatologist. dermatologist whose name is Dr. Julian Shamroth. Yes. Who wrote a whole book about the calendar and how it works. And I said to him like, so how's our calendar? So he was like, uh, if, uh you give me this face like <laughs> really like it's not so healthy what does that mean you know because there's a lot of math involved and things go off and that's why they add another day and there's like it's it's not so simple there's there, there's like a coordination between math and, and I, the more i talk about this the more i sound my like an eyes idiot, are glazing right? over <laughs> it's not my department exactly here's the i think i thought about laundry just now <laughs> here's the here's the here's the bottom line we have two months of joy yeah. <laughs> Don't you go worrying about that <laughs> stuff, folks. Okay? Uh, we have two months of joy. Now, the Lubavitcher Rebbe says something that is, like, groundbreakingly important. It's huge. It's massive. It'll change your life if you believe what I'm about to tell you right now in the name of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He says, we have a Jewish concept called batel b'shishim. If a piece of meat falls into a pot of milk, or the opposite. It really or the ends opposite. Up, let's say yeah. you have a chicken soup. And you have a you have chicken a soup and a drop of milk. Of milk. That falls in. If it's one drop of milk and it's so first you pass out, right? Okay, and then you like then they revive you, and then you have to deal with 
and then the you, aftermath. Don't forget, you yell at your husband, <laughs> right? <laughs> Idiot! <laughs> you ruined my good pot. And so um, the soup, the pot, the it's pot, a everything. Disaster. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's a disaster, right, Ishai? <laughs> uh, of course, of course, it's a disaster. It's no, what's you're called supposed a, to say no. It's not a disaster. Oh wait, I thought no because I, I was, was thinking, setting you up. That was a uh, that was you know in no, volleyball, the person who makes it go up high, the ball, and the then you're spike, supposed to spike it. You got to spike it. Okay, then you got to spike it. Yeah. No, but I, I, uh, the reason I remember that is just I was remembering the uh, show that we love, um, uh, Forged in Fire. Forged in Fire, great what, show, History what, Channel. What happens when when a when a knife has a flaw? Like catastrophic a, failure. Catastrophic failure, exactly. <laughs> so it's a show. Recommended, about, recommended it, show. It's fun show, for the whole family. It's a show about about making blades. It's a great. It's a show. competition it's about a competition. making blades. And it's just it's just a clean, awesome show about real stuff. Any case. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. We're talking about what happens after you revive me with the smelling salts, and then I have to figure out okay. what happened after that drop of milk. We got to help, the we gotta help people come back. Okay, yes. so, so let's, we're scared. Basically, he, just mock a donut for a second. Here it is. You drop the drop of milk into the meat. What happens is that you would think it's not kosher. You would have a catastrophic moment. we don't moment. eat milk and meat together. Right, because we do not eat meat. Not only that, but such a cooked moment of Couldn't meat mess and up milk. the pot also because pots are not supposed to be used for both things. Right, you can the, have it, pot if you use a pot for meat, it is not used for milk. Right, and it could it could it could trafe up the pot, mess up the pot. It's Just status. got chills. <laughs> That's right. But we have a concept of batel bashishim. If that drop is less than one sixtieth of the of the chicken soup, and it doesn't give lend taste, and it didn't lend any taste. Uh, any any noticeable taste? Then what happens is that it's it's okay, it passes. It's kosher because it is batel, which means it is diluted nullified. by si- in one sixtieth dilution, N- nullified in one sixtieth. Right. So the Lubavitch Rebbe says, if you are joyous for sixty days straight, right, you can nullify all of your little problems, all of the things that are bothering you, all of you unhappiness. If you fill your life with happiness for 60 days then uh all the things Does it have that to are, be the whole time or do you have to do elements of joy every day um, i hope for number two because yeah. i don't know if i could do number well, one well it's funny you say that because i was just before recording this i was on twitter yeah and some jewish dude was just calling me a liar and being mean liar! to me he was just being mean to me and and like and calling me out in, in an ad hominem way, I'm like, bro, you're going ad hominem on me. They're like, you don't even understand what ad hominem is. Why don't you look it up? And he sent me an, a, a link to ad hominem. I'm like, assaulting your character, but so, not- So the- what it says here then? Yeah. And this guy that was- That I going understood? Good. And, the, and then, and then uh, I was like, I was like, and and usually when it's an enemy, I can like put a smile on my face and start to really get get like heated up. But this guy was just like an angry Jew. Yeah, that that, that he, he was is just no fun. And and, and I there's was there's like, no there's no like sparring funness in right. that. So what I did was is I muted him. And yeah. you know what else? What? I smiled to myself and I said, "Nice try to get me out of my utter zone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, nice try." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and I have another little secret which I want to tell you. Right now here we're recording exactly a few hours after Rosh Chodesh Adar, right? Finished. But it's still Rosh Chodesh somewhere in the world. Ah, so nice. I count it as like it's still got the Rosh Chodesh nice, energy. Nice. It's got the juice. Well, you yeah. still, even if you're not in Rosh Chodesh, so you're still in Chodesh Adar, which is still really nice. Right, but still Rosh Chodesh Adar, I'm saying it's like, it's still Extra happening special. right now. It's still yeah. happening right now. And so Malka, you and I will take the 60 day challenge. Ooh, we'll try, we'll try, we'll 60 try. 60 day challenge of Ooh. joy. The 60. That's so much joy. There's, it is ridiculous amount of joy, almost. I don't know. Nosh, nauseous, noxious <laughs> amount of joy, really, to be joyous for so long. But but it is really indeed what we have to do. Now, I'm going to talk to you just for a second, Malka, yep. about something that makes me joyous. Go. There's something that makes me joyous in this world. Little things make me joyous. You have lots of things that make you yeah, joyous. Yeah, I'm a man who enjoys like little things in life makes me just make like me very happy. Like a good egg breakfast? Well. You're not eating breakfast these days. Yeah. Starting at 12. Intermittently. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I did have an amazing sandwich recently, one that you made, but I also was at a I restaurant. I know the other sandwich. I know about your other, your sandwich. other sandwich. Yeah, we were at a, a, a tourism ministry meeting in, uh, for Chevron. Afterwards, our boss took us out for a little bit of a small lunch, but it was just delicious. But that's not what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about snow piles. Snow piles. 
You see, last week we told you about the snow. It snowed we last week. a beautiful week. little snow. In the meantime, it's been sunny. It rained. Then it was, it's been sunny. It's been warm. And yet there are a few piles left. From when they cleared the roads. From the big, cle- big piles. The big piles. Now, I call these snow piles. Me and Leah came up with a name for them. They're called Snoopies. Okay? Snoopies. Hashtag. Snow pile. That's right. So, so little Snoopies. And I just love them. It's like 14 degrees Celsius outside. You know that there's like a ton of New Jerseyers and Ottawans and stuff listening to this show right now who are just like, what? That's right. Well, here in Israel, they know those people have visited Israel and they know that we don't get snow that often. And, and, and my sister came over last Shabbos with her kids and they enjoy the Snoopies, the snow piles, because where they live in, in, uh, in Rehovot, there are no Snoopies at all. There was no snow. So like, it's something special. It's very, Speaking very- Speaking of snow, I just have to give a shout out to two listeners who I know listen to our show, um, Gabriella and Jeanette. And they sent me the most unbelievable snow pictures from Switzerland. Uh-huh. Like, oh gosh! Like I want to print and hang I on my wall. I didn't yeah, see I'll that. Yeah, I'll show them to you. The Alps. And I want to. Ugh, they're sledding on like real sleds and stuff. Oh man! Not like the plastic garbage bags that we tried to wrap around a cardboard box so that we could snow in the and we could sled in the right. half melted snow here in right. the Holy Land no, no, of Israel. They're, yeah, they're in a snow a snow. They're in like a real snow Alps. wonderland. Yeah, the snow wonderland. Yeah. That's right. So, so sorry, I didn't mean to No, to, they're not looking for a Snoopy like I'm not, looking Yeah, for. I think the, their world is Snoopy right now. I just want to say I love Snoopies because because when I see a Snoopy, I'm like, you're strong. <laughs> Look at you, you're such a survivor. Just keep going. Keeping and I'm just like so proud. Everything else outside is like sunny, warm, and you stick your hand in that Snoopy. You don't really do that, right? You're not sticking your hand in the Snoopy. I haven't, I haven't, but I've wanted to every time. I'm just like because they're kind of black on the outside. Some of them are uh, in other colors, but uh, but let's not talk <laughs> about that. I'm saying that Snoopy is awesome, and I just I don't know. Maybe maybe it's the Jew. It's like you're a survivor. You're still there. Nice. There you are. Uh, but of course, the Jew is warm and not cold. Nice, uh, that's nice, right. We have nice, to serve nice. Hashem, and we're going to serve Hashem in joy. Now, speaking of Snoopy, mm-hmm. that rhymes with Whoopi. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good segue. I was I was ready for that for a long time. Wow, because I know we were talking about Whoopi Goldberg and her statements. Yeah. So I was like, how am I going to make that transition? And then I'm like, Snoopy, r- kind of rhymes with that's Whoopi. Good. You did it. And so there you go. Good now, for you. I know, I know. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg uh, was on The View. Yes. And she came That's out. That's a TV show she's on regularly, I believe. Okay. And she came out with uh, with a statement that the Holocaust wasn't really about race. They were talking about this book mm-hmm. in Tennessee. A lot of listeners probably already know the story. Okay. Um, in, in a Tennessee school district, they decided to take Mouse out of the um, curriculum. Mm-hmm. I have never read Mouse. It made me want to read Mouse after I read that. They mm-hmm. said that it wasn't good. What this cartoon thing? It's like yeah, it's with a cartoon it. mouse. It's, I haven't. It's harsh. It's harsh. Yeah. yeah. So th- they were teaching it to eighth graders, and they decided they don't want to teach it to eighth graders because maybe, from what you're saying, it's a little too harsh, and there might be some like nakedness or something in the book. They wanted to take it out. They didn't say that they're not going to continue to teach Holocaust studies or anything, but they're not going to use this book, and it caused kind of like a discussion in America about like a rehashing of the Holocaust issue, sort of. I was saying, you can't call this racism. This was evil. Mm-hmm. This, wasn't, this wasn't based on the skin. Have you come to understand that the Nazis saw it as race? Well, because they might, like, well, asking the Nazis, they would say, yes, it's a racial issue. Well, see, this is what's interesting to me, because the Nazis lied. It wasn't. They, they had issues with ethnicity. Not with race, because most of the Nazis were white people, and most of the people they were attacking were white people. What I saw is that she says, uh, you know, the Holocaust isn't really about race. It's really about the evils that mankind do to each other. Do to each other. So, on the fa- so that it was white people against white people, basically. That's what she said. Also, right? She yeah. said it was just white people uh, fighting white people. Right. Wow. Well. Wow. When that. When. When. Well, that's such a remarkable statement and it's like so 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 many people came out and and, and started speaking about this the, f- the first thing is it, it the first thing is is that there's a lot in america and an american psyche and black white that whole thing right the race like the race, war right it's which like, i don't maybe i'm living in the dark but i don't feel like is going on here in israel so much 
It's like not, in America, it's a really big issue. Right, still. it's a big issue. And look, I just want to tell you something. It uh, wasn't a big issue in America when I was growing up. So I, I'm going to say something general, okay? Yeah. Theories of Marxism, what they do is that they pin different classes against one another in general. Yeah. And when when Marxism came around, its its major goal was to pin the working class versus the, the rich and the owners and, and, and that kind of thing. And with time, it has evolved into a system by which you really destabilize a place through pinning various groups that have natural tendencies against one another. You foment that tendency. Uh, recently, KGB documents have, have been released, not just recently, but for, for years, basically explaining how they wanted to foment Nazi-like hate in the Arabs against the Jews because they wanted to destabilize this region and create a really? constant conflict. What is wrong with them? Uh, an excellent article was written by my friend Richard Kemp. Colonel um, Richard Kemp. Colonel Ke- Kemp, that's right. And uh, it was in Gatestone. And so, just so you understand, in general, mm-hmm. there are there are forces that are naturally have tensions with one another. A very simple one is men and women. Another one is because there's there's you know there's men can be violent and women can be victims and and it's all and it's this whole like you know sexual tension all these things, and so if you are looking to sow tension between forces, you that's that's what you that's what you focus on. Same thing between blacks and whites, which have historic tensions, um, and same thing for for uh, races and, and and sexes and and, and all these things. And so there, there's a there's a and left and right. There are forces out there that that benefit from our conflict between one another. Right. Just it's important to understand that. Okay. And so what America is going through partially this 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 black white thing, part of it is is this effort. Notice by the way, a person who uh, got into office and in his time the whole race thing came up very strongly was was President Barack Obama. Because President Barack Obama, by by his own pedigree, was part of the, a Marxist-Leninist way of thinking, uh, and instead of instead of creating an atmosphere of uh, of, of 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 cooperation, coexistence, and, and norm, normalcy, and the success of the black community, he stirred up, in my opinion, the way I understand it, a continuing tension. That, that was fomented much more than it was before. And that's what we're seeing some probably people today. argue. Some people would argue against you, Isha, and sure. say that these sure. were issues that were already extant, but that they weren't kind of... Uh, and they were You know, and, that and, the mainstream I, no, that, wasn't aware of them. That, and so, that I am going to agree with. There's yeah. always tensions, but somebody wants to co-opt, foment... Uh, what's the Hebrew English word? To stoke, to, uh, stoke, yeah, the, stoke fire. the fire. Stoke the fire. So that's issue number one. Now let's get back to Whoopi. So, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to yeah. say about this. Um, I saw the, the the first thing I saw was I saw uh, my friend Ben Shapiro mm-hmm. talk about. Um, he, he seemed mad. He was mad, and and he basically you know said this is part of the way of trying to delegitimize the Jews right. by turning us into white people. What I add to that is that that's one of the ways that you delegitimize Israel as a Middle Eastern Jewish country by saying the Jews are actually white interlopers, colonialists, and therefore apartheid, mm-hmm. blah, all that stuff. That all comes from us being now white. Right. Second thing is that what she was saying was, was uh, I think the Babylon B really captured it in a funny funny way they were just like it's a it's like a satir it's a satirical newspaper it's a satirical newspaper like the onion and they were like hitler is watching the view in hell and he's like what's wrong with her i called the jews germs i said that this was a war to end their race it was all about the race how could how could whoopi miss this and and a third thing was that uh, uh our friend eugene kantorovich uh, also tweeted about this and he you know he's a very famous international lawyer and he kind of just said like you know if if somebody would go back in time they would understand the jews as a race and and to to make them into white would be would be absurd and also isn't it silly that this lady named goldberg is not one of the members uh of, of that of, non-race of that non-race in any case the pot was stirred it's mm-hmm. funny how the holocaust pot gets stirred because because maka it turns out that history is always being reshaped. And I, I never forget that Noam Arnon, Dr. Noam Arnon, my, my, my colleague and mentor at Chevron, told me something that I never forgot. He said, when it comes to archaeology, there's a saying, the future is one and immutable, unchanging, 
the past is always changing. Right. And and that's the situation. Right. We the have analysis here. is always different. You know, when I I do not watch The View. And I haven't seen Whoopi Goldberg in anything since like Sister Act back in the way, way back in the day. So I had to kind of dig in in order to understand what this story was. And once I heard the story and what she said, and incidentally, I just want to note in fairness that she, after what happened, she brought Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL onto The View and she apologized for her statement. She said she stands with the Jewish people and that she had not intended that, and that she was very sorry for hurting people. And then Jonathan Greenblatt, I thought, did a, did a pretty nice job of ta- of briefly explaining that the Holocaust was a um, indeed a, a racial, a, a racial like a um, an effort to annihilate the Jewish people. Right. And the people are a specifically race. the Jewish right. people, the right. Jews, right. and other peoples also. They didn't right. like. It wasn't like too. If general. You're, if your father's father was Jewish which means that you are technically not Jewish. You are still, cons- uh, according to the Jewish ethnicity, right. racially, you were considered a Jew and you were an enemy of the state. Right. And there was the Nuremberg Laws, which were right. specifically race-oriented against the Jews. So, okay, so, like, so, so, but I, I heard that you had a... I had a different reaction. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. My initial reaction. And I think it's fair also to, like, chew over this stuff and to like get you know have layers of it and to come to different um conclusions after a while and stuff like that but i'll tell you about my initial reaction that's that's a good point by the way i just want to say i appreciate what you're saying we we live in such a jerky reaction i myself trigger fingers are very itchy yeah i myself am am sometimes uh uh, do that right that's the culture today it's like and no one's allowed to make a mistake Right. And no one's allowed to be like, you know what, I sh- I didn't really mean what the way I said that. Or like, I did mean it, but now that I've thought about it, I realized that that was wrong. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, and I, I really would like personally, so that was one reaction I had, which is like, I would like to get back to a world in which like you don't get canceled for everything, even anti-Semites. Yeah, this this Jew, okay? this Jew that was angry at me, he was like, you don't deserve your, your name rabbi and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, bro, you're just right, it's like erasure. Me. Right. It's right, like you want to right. erase people. Right. And so like ABC or whatever network that this show is know. on, they I like they took her off for two weeks. Ooh, uh. Even after she did this thing with with Greenblatt. Wow. Now, she also went on some other show like a nighttime Colbert or something like that, like a nighttime comedy show. And she was still talking about this stuff. But there were claims it was taped before. And I don't know. OK, OK. But the point is she got on The View and she apologized. Now, yeah. I don't want to be what they call in Israel a friar. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to be a sucker and just because a person gets in trouble and then apologizes for the thing that they got in trouble for so that they won't be in trouble anymore doesn't mean I have to trust them, listen to them or believe them. But there was something about this. I even saw as she was like arguing this argument, I thought to myself, this is not a person who even knows what they're talking about. Right. And for her, possibly because of her politics, possibly because of her community, she's an actress, guys. Like she is not a great scholar of history or whatever and she in her experience and in her mind race and she said it basically is like i think race is where i can look at you and go you're this Mm -hmm. you're that you're hispanic you're black you're whatever and so uh which and the nazis incidentally you know they're famous pictures of the nazis like measuring the noses of the jews and trying to figure out the the uh, visual cues to determine what a Jew looks like and how many Jews hid in the Holocaust or even some of them amidst society because they didn't quote unquote look Jewish, right? So this this thing of look for her yeah. was by, like... By the way, my grandfather uh, looked and spoke Polish. Right. And was able to... To kind of to blend evade. in that yeah. way, mm-hmm. right. So, so I don't mm. like it's dumb of her and she's so wrong. But like at the same time, I don't have high expectations from her. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like I I understand that to her. But on Star Trek, her. she was Guinan. Right, that's which true. Which was really it was very a wise. wise. Yeah, that's it's her whole so thing ironic. was wise. Right. Well, yeah. she failed big time. Yeah. Anyway, so I just thought to myself, like this person doesn't get it, and they don't understand what makes race. And part of that is the culture of today. Right. Which is like it's so much about your actual physical coloration. Right. And I resent that. Right. I personally resent that. Well, you should resent that. Of I course. don't know. I like, yeah. uh, I guess maybe because like I'm a light skinned person, but I am not from a Caucasian race. I am not a Caucasian. You have dark features. 
I have dark, you know, yeah, I guess I have dark features, but I'm like, I burn in the sun. Right. But that doesn't make me not Jewish. Right. 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 Another thing that I kind of reacted to. There's also some difference, and I don't want to get into it between race and ethnicity. I don't. So Jew, yeah. Jew, Jews are all those things, but not all, not each individual necessarily is all those things. Meaning to say like a Jewish person who is a convert, so they are Jewish, but then they're not racially Jewish. <laughs> Right. Because if you check their DNA, they're not racially Jewish. But once they're marrying a Jew and they have kids and those kids are racially Jewish. Anyway, that's not the important. I, part. I, I do want to say something yeah. just for a second. There's a, there's an interesting discussion between what is race, and what is ethnicity. One thing is for sure, though, the Jews are a very ancient people <laughs> right. who have passed down their familial tribal way in a very special legal determination about who is a Jew. Uh, mostly, of course, except for the convert issue, uh, because we do have another opening. But generally speaking, we have kept very tight right. who we marry and how we promulgate our peoplehood. And yet, at the very same time, one of the mystical and miraculous and metaphysical things is that the Jewish people, wherever they've lived, they've looked like those people. The Jews are, in some ways, the best Ethiopians and the best Yemenites and the best Germans. I don't mean even mean like the best. like chameleons. No, because on the mystical level, and the Torah says this, there's an element of the Jews which is separate than the nations, and there's a mystical element in which the Jews are representative of the nations. Mm. And there's something about that. American Jews are, in some ways, the best of America. And they, they, they take that forward and they push it forward. and they When and they, they are. And when they are, right. And yeah. they, and they, but they teach it and they value it. And, and, and some of our Arabic scholars are the best Arabic speakers there is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's something, there's something in this world that God created where the Jewish people, other than all the hate that we face, in some ways we're there to represent to God to be the ministering German Jew to God so that so that this is his channel to the Germans. Interesting. And 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 there's no other way to explain it because Russian Jews are Russian. And and in many ways they are like and I know this firsthand they're the best of the Russian culture. And they present and look and speak and and they're the finest of the finest examples of it because it's almost like they come to God and be like I speak for the Russians. I am. I am the emissary. I am the minister. I am the they ambassador. They become like the quintessential Russian. Right, I'm the ambassador. When my family, of the moved, when my parents moved to Texas, I can't say they became Texans. Your father didn't. Become but he Texans. like. But they became like the proudest. The proudest Texans. Texans. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And 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 it, and it's and it's not. We can analyze it psychologically and 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 how Jews live in the diaspora and how they assimilate. Forget that just for a moment. There's something more. There's something more, something very, very special. Let's go on. Okay, so that was one thing. Another thing that I thought was a little bit interesting, and this is where it might become a little controversial. That's okay. okay? That's okay. So we'll have to talk it out. And if people want to email you with like yelling at, yellings at me or or um, at least uh, disagreements with me, that's totally fine. But let's talk it out. <clears throat> so another reaction that I had was how ironic it felt to me. Mm-hmm that Jews were so concerned with showing them showing themselves. Now this is a kind of very American story, but that Jews in America were uh, very concerned with showing themselves to be racially Jewish. Because to me, there was some, there's something now there are some Jews who are always very proud uh, Jews who always are ready to stand out as Jews. And there are some Jews who don't want to stand out as Jews. Say it a little bit more, Malka. G- give it a little bit There's more. There's some Jews who really want to blend Let, in. Yeah, let's let's let's. There's some Jews who really want to blend in. We call it assimilation. Okay. Right, right. There's some Jews who really want to assimilate. And surely, surely, American Jewry, in large measure, in massive measure, has assimilated into right. America. Right. And by far, and, if you're a Jew not, listening not to this America. show right now, you're probably not one of those people. Okay, like meaning to say, if you've gotten to this show and you're listening to to show about Israel and you want to hear about Ishai's Torah with Rabbi Mike, then you're probably not the Jew who is trying to just fade away into America. But first, thing, it was, first thing it's important to just say if you're going to mention that uh, first thing, Rabbi Mike is not on this week's show, uh, and second thing is that I also have a lot of Gentiles, right. lovers of Israel, 
uh, who are an amazing lot of people Absolutely. who simply really love amazing. the God of Israel, love the Torah of Israel, love Israel, love the people right. of Israel. And they understand the, the place of the nation of Israel and the story of the world. And want to understand it and right. want to connect to it. Right. To me, that's one of the most beautiful things in the world. The, that to me is like these souls of people that like want to want to plug in right. to, to, to this thing that they see as God's revelation. So it kind of surprised me in this story that the, there was such an outcry right. against what happened when it sometimes feels like a lot of people are really pretty happy to bleed out of the Jewish race. Right. Like they're ready to not be not in the Jewish bleed race. Out, not bleed out, hug out, m- make money out, live out. But when you touch that Holocaust, right? Button, then you, yeah, you go. The Holocaust was about everybody. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. WTF? Okay, <laughs> this is not about everybody. This was about us. And there was something. And God is so smart. And I don't know why we're so dumb. But there's something about the Jews that, like, every once in a while, God has to like activate. It's very sad in a sense, but it's also very effective, which is that He needs to activate this like anti-Semitism thing every once in a while and right. make us but remember. Wait, but wait, was she was she being anti-Semitic? So that's that's a question, right? Because some people were mind. like, was she being anti-Semitic? No, I I don't think she was being anti-Semitic. Was I don't think she was being anti-Semitic. Insensitive? I think she was being an extreme outsider. That's what I think. Right. right. I think she was being a person who like really lives in her world, doesn't think about Jews, doesn't like, doesn't really know. Sometimes, Although she, you know, she is from Hollywood. Like it can't be that she never encountered her, a Jew. Her agent is Jewish. Listen, it could also be that what she chose is, a Jewish name on purpose. Right. She has said in the past that she feels a connection to the Jewish people and that, mm. that she feels like she has to be Jewish. Right. Now that could just, I don't know what that's from. Maybe it's a lie. Maybe it's true. I, I really don't know. I think that sometimes big things become like a metaphor for you and they become a metaphor for your struggle. And in her mind, the struggle is between black and white and these things. And so the Holocaust, which is this thing, it becomes like a kind of metaphor so for I, you. I want to talk about the Holocaust but, metaphor but, for a second. But one way or another, it's, it's, it's obtusely insensitive. So, but I have to say something. Go about on. that in obtuse insensitivity. Right. Okay. And this is another moment where you may be emailing me. Okay. But I honestly, one of the thoughts that I had was an angry feeling mm-hmm. at Jews. Right. Here's why. I thought to myself, for so long, you and I and other people have been trying to rally the Jewish people around their... I don't like the word race for this because it's just no, cold, they're, they're but around na- their familial... It's called their nation, their tribe. Their nationhood. Yeah, peoplehood. Okay, nationhood, around their tribe. nationhood. When all my growing up, I knew very much, and my grandparents are Holocaust survivors, and that was a very like, big part of my like, Jewish identity. Like full-on Holocaust like, survivors. Real, with like, numbers, and we thing. talked about it a lot, right. and my grandfather wrote his books about it that I still can't read because I can't bring myself to like deal with it because it feels too close to me. Anyway, uh, Allah wa shalom. Anyway, so um, I felt anger, and I'll tell you why. Because so often I find, you know, there's so much effort that goes into like Holocaust remembrance, Holocaust memorials, and I know that the people who do that are, are genuine. You know, they want to not forget because this was such a, a fundamental experience for the Jewish people and such a horror that it's, there's no words for it. And they're, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, uh, keep the memory of that alive because it's important. Right. And yet I have found so many times that the message is that we have to be good to each other and that evil can happen at any time and that we have to destroy hate off the face of the earth, racial hate. Right. We have to destroy hate and all kinds of hate right. off the face of the earth. Otherwise, this could happen again. Right. Right. And I've always thought to myself, those are nice messages, but that's not the thing. Right. Those are good messages. I can't be against that. Right. Those are good messages. But that's not what it is. But then you have a person like Whoopi Goldberg, who's like, you know what this is about? This is about not hating each other and how people can be bad to each other. And everyone's like, what the heck is this? It's not about that. It's about the Jewish race. And And this feeds into like a little bit of a problem that I in general have with the like Israel message also, which is like a lack of um, message discipline as we talk about sometimes on the show. 
like a lack of unity when it comes to the message. And so I've, I'm a little bit angry at some of the people who control some of the message about Holocaust remembrance. And I feel like this kind of stuff is their fault. And that if people are confused, it's probably because we have not done a the perfect job. Now, there are anti-Semites out there who want to destroy the message and dilute the message and, and confuse people about the Jews. And they've confused non-Jews and they've confused Jews. And it's I get that it's a, a sophisticated thing. But there was there was a part of me that was like, well, look, look what you made. Right. Like you, there you go. Like Hasbara, you created a world in which people don't actually know that right. the Jewish people are a race, and they don't actually know that the Jewish people have been persecuted throughout time, and they don't actually know that a Jew is a separate individual, even if they look just like you, they are not you. And we have not held up our side of making sure that understanding is clear to everybody no you're you're you said it even even stronger which is we've actually been part of the confusion of that message and i agree with you some of us and i i wrote about it uh years ago in hebrew uh, in uh in olam katan i wrote like you know there's some there's some ideas that 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 there's israel there's a little Nazi in all of us. We could easily all turn to Nazis if you give us a gun. And here in Israel, gosh, this is the left's idea. If we have guns and we have become then we're a the state, Nazi. then we're the new Nazi. And and that that's that and that's something Couldn't that be the farther from the global truth. left and and the jihad wants to uh, wants to send out there and right, which us. is what Ben Shapiro. That's the kind of message way, that Ben Shapiro is trying to make. L- Link, no, he's trying. He's trying to say that the left has an right, agenda right, right, to create right, 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 this right. message. Check this out. Check this out. Yeah, you have. Amnesty International putting out uh, this anti-Israel report that everybody's talking about. It's basically full of lies and 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 and. It just shows who they are, really. Right. You have Whoopi with this confusion about about race and, and the Holocaust. You have the uh, young so-called settlers and their. Uh, coming down and burning the cars of some Palestinian activists and, and hitting them and, and pushing that and, and a lot of Jews being shocked at that and, and calling and condemning for, it. for widespread right? condemnation of it. And now you also have the IDF issuing a report condemning similar type of young men who are soldiers in the Israeli army uh, who who were being badgered and, and, and hit and, 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 and accosted by this Arab 80 year old and then tied him tied him tied his hands and put him t- and it kind of to the side and and then when they released him it turned out that he had heart had a heart attack or something like that and that's the 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 the, the, the actual facts of it are, are not totally right, clear there, yeah there's but the yeah, bottom line is like if, if you look they're all they're all linked up they're all linked up and they're all linked up with a certain confusing message i often say to people the most important thing that the jewish state should be doing is working on clarity 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 here is what we are here's what we expect here's what what are the laws of this land here's what we will not accept and clarity though ishai means decision making right right exactly and that's what right. that's what people are having trouble with they don't want to make a decision they're trying to push off the decision right that's what this that's what the last so many years of uh, Israeli uh, Arab negotiations have been about right. a, a, a lack of in- a very strong lack of interest in saying like we officially are saying that we're doing X and that's what we're right. doing. You're right, and and we're we're out of time to talk about to, to talk about that. That's well, this very was a spicy stuff. show today. You bet, you bet, Maka. With you, it's also spicy. It's always spicy. You know what I mean? You're the you're the you know you're you're, you're the the spicy Tom in in my life and in the life <laughs> of the show. God bless you, uh, and and of course. Uh, but we put all that spice is going to be batal bashishim, right? Because we're going to have a joyous two months yes. now, and let us work on that joy. I I wouldn't have this joy if it wasn't for the people that make this show happen. That's Yochevet Seidman, Ben Bresky, Moshe Herman, Tabitha, and Lou, uh, who helps the show uh, happen and get it out to you. So thank you, and it wouldn't happen without the folks that are listening to the show right now. And it wouldn't happen without the folks that support by going to ishaifleischer.com and supporting some of our projects by hitting the donate page. And also our new and really quite successful uh, coffee page, which I'm really excited about. Buy which me is a called coffee. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. 
and people have just been buying me coffees. It's a virtual kind of coffee, and it's a way to donate to the show. And Robert and Nancy write, snow here in North Carolina and snow there in Israel. Your ministry, I love that word, um, (laughs) and life uh, brings smiles and encouragement to us. We were blessed to have visited Israel two years ago for our 50th anniversary. We left part of our heart there, and you continue to bless us with your wisdom and energy. Maka is a firecracker (laughs) that always gives your show a big bang of excitement you see that's so nice that's right and barbara writes thank you for the wonderful podcast it's both informative and inspiring i love it when your wife is on with you you see that uh uh, bill says thanks isha i enjoy listening to your podcast and and many other folks uh including uh gabor who writes uh hi isha i listened to your podcast yesterday and heard about you and malka going through omicron may the almighty keep you guys safe and hope that you get well soon. Thank you. Shalom from Norway. Shalom from Norway. That's right. Shalom to Norway. That's right. Shalom from Norway. Uh, so a lot, and and I, uh, I I have a great merit of going uh, a lot of Saturday nights into a Finnish uh, a sauna, so that you know Finland is not far from Norway. So I feel a connection of the uh, uh, the, the sauna connection. I see that our young our young boy has come to us now, and he uh, wants to interrupt you, Malka. So let's uh, close off this That's half. It, close it up. I want to thank you very much, Malka, for joining the show. The show continues though uh, with Rabbi Shalom Schwartz. Nice. Uh, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments and um, their impact and creating a curriculum of the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to ask him some spicy questions about the challenge to the Ten Commandments from things like China and Ooh, others who are who are not putting things like the, the God is uh, uh, you know one as their first uh, as their Very first interesting. commandment. Very uh, interesting. And then we're going to do a little table Torah uh, with Parsha Truma, uh, and I'm going to give some some uh, some thoughts uh, about Parsha Truma that you could share at your Shabbat table. So God bless you, Malka, and Shabbat Shalom. Thanks so much for being with me. Shabbat Shalom. More great stuff is in the way, folks. Stay tuned, stay strong, stay connected. We'll be right back, and Shalom. All right, everybody. Shalom, and welcome to the Yishai Fleischer Show. It's been a long and awesome week. Last week we had snow, and now uh, we only have snow piles left uh, on the roads here in, in the Gush Etzion and the Judea region uh, of the land of Israel. But I love those snow piles because they are so... Um, you know, strong out there, courageous, holding on to their identity out there in the heat. There's, there's just a strong snow pile. Um, this week's Torah portion is an awesome Torah portion called Truma. Uh, the, the Torah portion, which is Malka tells me to say the word Parsha, right? Which is uh, the part that we read of uh, of, of uh, the Torah, the, 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 the Bible. And it's all about the vessels of the tabernacle and it's the blueprint Torah portion. It's one of the it's one of those blueprint Torah portions where it's going to lay out how to do things, how to make the menorah, how to make the the tabernacle, the mizbech, how to make the showbread table. So really cool stuff, but also a lot of very nitty gritty stuff. Uh, and um, and this week's Torah portion is very beautiful. Uh, but I thought it was also a great opportunity to talk about something that happened uh, two Torah portions ago that I. I, I didn't give it the attention that it deserved. And that was the Torah portion of Yitro and that we didn't get a chance to discuss the Ten Commandments fully. And I want to say hi to my very good friends. This is so great because my some of my best friends are already here on the show. Uh, Moshe Herman says, hey, bro. Hey, bro. It's great to see you. I'm so glad you're here. And we're doing our segment uh, right now. And uh, for, for, for today's podcast, it's going to come up tomorrow's podcast. And Lou Weiss, uh, my good friend and co-producer here, Moshe, also producing the show, gets it out to the netwaves. Lou says, Erev Tov Yishai, looking and sounding good. Great, Lou. Thank you so much for being with us. And Linda says, good Chodesh from New York. Thank you. And happy, uh, happy new month. And uh, Michael Menashe says, Kol Kavod I haven't even done anything yet, but he says, all, all the honor to you. Great. And... Uh, Evo says Shalom, and many other people are coming on. So here's the deal. Today we got to talk about the Ten Commandments. We got to talk about the importance of the Ten Commandments. And uh, it was a few years ago uh, that I met Rabbi Shalom Schwartz, and he told me about his work with the Ten Commandments. And I thought to myself, this is something so important, and I haven't had him on. Uh, he's a, he's a person who spent 30 years in Aish, teaching in Toronto, teaching Russian Jews, and being a a very very close student of the late great Rabbi Noach Weinberg. And so uh, he has also taken it upon himself to make the Ten Commandments uh, more realistic, more, more, more palpable, more of a life, uh, life trajectory, a life, a life goal. 
Ten Commandments, like you know, we we hear about it, but but have we made it uh, uh, like something that's so part of our life? In fact, I'm going to ask Malka to. I was going to do it before the show. I'm going to take. I'm going to ask her to get something from the kitchen because we have a Ten Commandments in the kitchen. I'm going to ask her to do it in a second. But Rabbi Shalom Schwartz has done amazing work, uh, and it is a great honor uh, to have him on the show. Rabbi, welcome to the show. Shalom and welcome. Thank you, Rabbi Shai. Great to be here. It's great to have you on, and uh, and a good friends, uh, good friends around the world are joining us, including uh, Yitzi Katowitz, who is. Uh, uh, <laughs> he says, always nice to see Rabbi before Yishai. I think it's because uh, I was just getting hammered on Twitter by some guy who was calling to take away my smicha for whatever reason. <laughs> and then, uh, But Yitz, uh, Yitzi is doing great work at uh, making Jewish Lego, and he's working on the most incredible model of Maratha Machpelah that you've ever seen. So we're very, very excited. And Allison says... Shalom from Mark Pickles and Allison in Manchester is there, my very good friends. And many more people are coming in, including Shalom from Brazil. Now, um, Rabbi Shalom Schwartz, Ten Commandments. Sometimes I get jealous of people like you. You, like, picked the the crowning thing and decided to make it a life goal. Tell me how you got to, to the Ten Commandments as the thing in your life. <laughs> Okay, if I can just back up a little bit, because you said you, you, you were looking for a segue from this week's Parsha to the Ten Commandments, and it, it's sort of obvious, but it's 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 not obvious. In other words, it's it's like, yeah, where are you going to talk about Ten Commandments in this week's Parsha? It's all about the temp, you know, the Mishka and the tabernacle, all the different vessels. And where's the Ten Commandments? And the answer is, you know, if somebody said to you, you know, the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, did you ever see that film? Sure. Okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's got like the, the Ark, that's it, the Ark of the Tablets, and, and it's got such power, and we watch that film, and everybody's thinking, wow, if we only find the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Lost Ark, you know where it is? Does anybody know where it is? And there's been searches for it in Africa, and there's all sorts of places, that, and I, I always felt to myself when I heard about this searching for the Lost Ark, imagine that we actually found it, okay? There's, right. and, and there's CNN is on the spot, and everybody's looking... And, and they open up the ark. And what's in it? The tablets. And what's written on the tablets? The Ten Commandments. And you go, oh, okay. Well, we, we have the Ten Commandments. They're not lost. Right. You know, there, there's this sort of feeling of the, the mystique around the, the tabernacle. And what's it says right at the beginning of the Parsha, you're doing all this so you should put the edut, the testimony, that in the ark, which is at the heart of the tabernacle, the tabernacle is completely all about what's at its heart, which is the Ten Commandments. Right. So it's it's a it's exactly about this parsha. It's the perfect parsha mm -hmm. to speak about this because it actually <laughs> reveals what the essence of the tabernacle is talking about. I guess I guess another way of saying what you're just saying is that this week's Torah portion that deals with the ark is about the carrying forth. Of the Ten Commandments, of 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 taking it with you, Beautiful. of making it part of the the travels of your life. Beautiful, perfect. Uh, so, so it is a vehicle for those things. So so that that really feels great to to talk about it now. Now that you made that clear, okay. So still, how did you yeah, personally? Okay, so how did I get to this? Yeah. So I, the the story that I'll I'll share is two thousand and seven on a street corner in Tel Aviv. Okay, that was a turning point in my life on this issue. And I had spent about a year and a half doing research on various things. There are certain things that have bothered me for many years. One of them was the the, the, dis, the disunity that I was experiencing in the Jewish people. You know, I made Aliyah. I came to Israel from Toronto, Canada. And, and most Jews in the diaspora, I would say, and it's hard to generalize, but, you know, there's a feeling of, you know, you're a minority amongst the majority, and you're sort of like, there's this feeling of family with Jews, even if they're very different from you. Whereas when I came to Israel, I encountered this sectorialness, this sense of, you know, he's religious, he's not, this one's that, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, there was a lot of division, but not just, uh, you know, div divisiveness I experienced in, in a short period of time. And, and so it bothered me over the years. So I always had this feeling of what really unifies us as Jews. And, and, you know, I had different various answers to that. And certainly one could argue many things. But the other thing was, I always felt there was always, and I also, in my years of being here in Israel, I encountered such idealism 
amongst most Israelis. Um, again, not everyone and not in all situations, but there was this feeling of wanting to make this country what we came back here for. And we came back with a vision. You know, the, as Rev. Noah Weinberg used to say, in 1948, the world was holding its breath. With bated breath, they looked to see, what are the Jewish people going to do now? They're back on, they're back on the scene. They're back in history. And, and then we had to go. We had to build roads. We had to build schools. We had to build infrastructure. But, you know, now we have Startup Nation. We have our army. We have a good economy. And it was time to say, well, what, what kind of vision do we have for you know, aligning our that idealism with making this country the, the country that we really want it to be. Mm -hmm. And and the third thing was I was always disturbed by, you know, it's a it's a little bit of a state secret, but there's there's about a million Israelis that had left the country since 1948. And I remember when I came back and people asked me, you know, where are you from? I'm from Canada. Really? Why did you make Aliyah? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, life is much easier in Canada. You don't have the army. You don't have this. I have a better standard of living. Why would you act like because they were asking me as if they couldn't believe someone who had such a, you know, a comfortable life in Canada would actually move to such a much more difficult life. We had this conversation earlier, but, you know, presumably a difficult life in Israel. And I, I looked at them. I said, I'm, I'm coming home. This is my home. But the, it always disturbed me when I would think about you know, all the sacrifice and all the, the miracles that went into the creation of the state of Israel that, that many Israelis didn't find staying here, you know, they left. You know, every, for a certain amount of time when you'd speak to Israelis in, outside of Israel, they'd say they only left temporarily, you know, now it's three generations, but it's still on our way back. And I believe that, and it's sincere on one level, but it was always disturbing to me. Anyways, on a street corner in Tel Aviv, a woman named Sharon Portugali, who's a kibbutznikid from Kibbutz uh, Ma'agan Michael, you know, so-called secular Jew, who I had been, she and her her husband, and I, I had these discussions with them about how do we unify Jews, how do we bring us this idealism together, how do we work on this from secular to religious, you know, to all these divisions. So she looked at me, she said, she'd just gotten out of the car, and she looked, and she said, you know, Shalom, I've been thinking about what you're looking for. I, I, I understand what you're looking for. You don't have to create it. It's already there. Mm. It's the Ten Commandments. The Aserah to the Brut in Hebrew, the Ten Commandments. And I, and I looked at her and she said, don't you realize that's it? That's what the whole Ten, the ten Commandments answer all these questions that you've been troubled by. They mm. are this thing that unifies all Jews and certainly all Israelis. It's, and, and, it, and it gives us this, this connection to creating. It's like a vision. It's a national vision for how the country should look. Imagine if we're all keeping the Ten Commandments, what would this country look like? She said one thing, right. though. Said and, and not only that, she said that you might think, well, the average secular Israeli doesn't feel, um, you know, it's too religious for them. But she said, you're wrong. The average is secular Israeli like me feels that we, it's ours. The Aserat Dibrod are actually, mm. these Ten Commandments actually express who we are, our identity. And I looked at her, I said, Sharon, uh, I, I, I was really literally it, in shock. It is sometimes a it is sometimes a woman's necklace, for example. Like my wife has maybe two, I think, necklaces of the Ten Commandments. I mean to say that in some ways the Ten Commandments is a uh, index of laws, but in other ways it's also an identity. It's also something that you can identify yourself with. I am I am a I am a follower of these things. This 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 is totally. the code that I live by. Totally. And, and I'll, I'll add to that, that I subsequently found a, a statement from the rabbis. It relates to what you were saying earlier, that the, it says that before the Ten Commandments were imprinted on the stones, on the stone tablets, they were actually imprinted on the souls of the Jewish people at mm -hmm. Sinai. Mm -hmm. And and we found, Israelis actually said this, it's this, the Ten Commandments, that's us. It's an expression of identity. And like you said, you've ever think of it as making it a life goal. It's much more than that. It's literally an expression of our identity. It's imprinted on our souls as sort of a spiritual and moral DNA code that we can align ourselves with. And when you see the depth of that and you see the level of identification that especially in Israel they have with that, 
it's it's actually quite obvious that it's something that's been overlooked for all these years as a force for unity, a force for positive change, and ultimately an expression of who we are. Okay, so you've developed, you've taken this kind of ideology towards uh, the development of uh, a website and a, a curriculum for schools, and and they have entered the schools here in Israel, and you also have uh, ways to 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 get people on board through uh, a website that's aseretglobal.org, A-S-E-R-E-T, aseret, which means 10, global.org, like the Ten Commandments, but globally.org. And I'm uh, putting that uh, putting that up right now for people to see. And I saw that you could join uh, classes and you could and you can bring a curriculum to your school. So you've done a lot of, of work on that. And what I want to do is I want to, I want I want to spice it up a little bit, right? Because the Ten Commandments are kind of famous on the one hand, but maybe they're not kind of famous in, in another hand. And and I will tell you a little story that happened to me just like a month ago. And uh, no, it was I must have been two months ago. I was in Miami uh, for a conference called the IAC, the Israel America Coalition, and it was in a great lobby. Uh, uh, it was a, gr- a great hotel and a, and a nice lobby there. Um, and I met a guy uh, that I met from a different conference. His name is Mark Goldman. And Mark Goldman says to me, I don't know how we got talking about this. He's like, today there are culture, there are parts of the cultural world. He named them. I think in his words, there were the progressives and other things, but he says they are every, they want to go against every one of the 10 commandments. So, you know, it sounds hyperbolic. And then he started listing and he said to me, and I wrote it down. I wrote it down what Mark Goldman said to me. I said, he's to me murder. He says, that's late term abortion. They want to get rid of babies that are already fully formed and, 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 and kill them off. That's murder. And then that's, and that's legal murder. He says, theft, uh, shoplifting has become uh, practically legal in, in parts of California uh, where you're like not going to be prosecuted for a theft of less than uh, less than nine hundred dollars something like that and it's just like you see theft is 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 legalized coveting he says tax the rich right take from some one person and give it to another person that's that's coveting he says uh, parents have no uh, specific uh, rights anymore. Don't trust the parents. That's an old 60s term. Remember, don't trust anybody over 30. So honor your parents is, is thrown out the window. Media, they are machines of bearing false witness, says Mark Goldman. Uh, Shabbat, he said something interesting. I don't know if I took good notes on that. He said, every day is like Shabbat. Every day is the Sabbath. You, you can, you know, you're not supposed to work too much and thereby killing the, uh, the idea of Shabbat. Uh, and he says, uh, n- there's there's also it's a society of no repercussions, which means there's no God. Nobody's really looking at you. You do what you want. Uh, and and that's some of the ways that he said to me that there are elements of society that are today anti the Ten Commandments specifically. And another example of that, and I don't mean to, to badmouth a whole powerful hegemon, but it seems like China is a machine uh, that has its ideology, but one of its ideologies, its main one is we don't we're not you're not allowed to have religion in china and and its global influence uh, has could have that as well and so there's like a kind of godlessness in this this juggernaut that is that has influence all over the world so uh, i i wanted to spice things up a little bit and say to you okay here's a guy who says there are elements that are anti 10 commandments what's what's your answer to that what do you think is that is that true are there people that are that are picking up the 10 commandments and saying i'm going against this uh, and is is there a kind of contra world, which is maybe what you're bringing to say, no, no, let's make this real in our lives? It's a very, you know, I happen to know Mark. I think it's a very oh, yeah. powerful, it's very beautiful and powerful observation. Uh, there is a book that some that uh, David Kingsley is his name wrote on showing how America is basically breaking all the Ten Commandments, and uh, it's it's a 300 page book. You get very depressed by reading it. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 there's actually a a, a one or two minute video that I once saw called breaking all the 10 commandments before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> it's genius. It was a little, you know, it had every one of them and then it flashed on the screen when you were breaking. Yes, we do break the, that. That's the point. It, it's, mm. it's, it's, these are things that are easily broken. Now, having said that, I think that the, the point of, of, is, is anybody happy with that? Is this, do we celebrate these, you know, shoplifting is rampant? Do we sell, you know, we, we, these are not, 
there's a there's a uh, you know this um, what's the word I'm looking for? You're, you're sort of it's a collision course with the Ten Commandments. Like the mm -hmm. reason that those things rub us is because they're in the Ten Commandments and they rub against our core values. Right. And and the the Ten Commandments are meant to be core values. And I I love that term because it's something that really speaks to this same point. They're in our core. And and when we run up against them and we see somebody, God forbid, violence or stealing or murder, you know, but even adultery, you know, maybe we become, you know, used to it. So there's, you know, there is this thing of sort of, oh, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> what can you do? But if you really look at it in the face and you say, okay, this is, this is tragic, you know, that people are destroying the fabric of trust in marriage and you hear about it with a god forbid a, a relative or a friend you go oh that's that's tragic so it, it's being in touch with the fact that that part of you that is at your core is really not just annoyed but is is, is screaming you know there's part of us that goes I, I i can't allow that to be it's unacceptable and and that's the power of identifying them as core values and consciously carrying them now, I, we discussed this earlier, you know, D Alan Dershowitz was on record as saying that the, there's only nine commandments that are applicable today in America. Uh, you forget about the last one, don't covet. The whole society is built on 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 covening, on, on advertising that is basically preying on your desire to covet. That's what the capitalist society is. Forget about it. Let's let's deal with nine. Well, I, I, I would take a, a little issue with that because I would just say, one of the beauties of the America that I knew uh, is that actually uh, there was this belief that you too can earn it and get it and and live the dream. And you don't you don't have to covet another person's thing. You just have to work hard, and and the system will give you a chance. So there was something kind of. And if you go to Middle America, you go to you know the places that I go to, you still see that it's a very beautiful. There, there's this. Yeah, people want stuff. But they don't want other people's stuff necessarily. They just they're just living a, you know a good and decent and wholesome life. And really, in in, in America, I think you're going to find a lot of people who think that the Ten Commandments are indeed a very important part of life. I agree with you, and I I think he's he's not reading the whole situation. But it, what it what it raises is that you know we the average person is constantly bombarded with information through advertising saying if you don't have X you're missing out something crucial for your life. If right. you don't look like why, you right. know, you're, you're not, you know, so the, 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 the eye culture, the selfie culture, the, <laughs> the, um, is, is really preying on, I don't have looks like she does. I wish right. I did. Right. So that, without going into the halachic, the, the actual legal aspect of the 10 commandment, don't covet, which is a, a longer discussion, but clearly the 10 that don't covet has this core principle to it. What we say is in the mission says, don't look at somebody else in order to get your satisfaction. Where they say, don't try to live someone else's life that's already taken. The only one that you can live is your life. And right. the mission says, Ezu Samech Bechelko, Ezu Ashir Samechelko. The one who's truly rich is the one who is truly taking pleasure in what he has. Right. And we know that our children are bombarded by this, and the, and there's a massive a challenge to grow up in an environment like that and truly realize that you have a unique purpose that's been designed for you by God and, and all even the challenges you've been given are specific before you. So each of these Ten Commandments are meant to be fulfilled not only in avoiding the negative, I'm talking now about the, the ones that are phrased in the negative form, but the, the, the core idea that's really important here is each of these has a positive core value that underlies it. Yeah. So in the case of don't covet, it has to do with happiness and it has to do with understanding unique purpose. Right. So re re really, really one can read, one can read it as, uh, and I, I'm sorry to be pithy. It's not my way, but one can read it as a roadmap to happiness because every one of them, uh, loving God, honoring God, uh, not bearing false witness, not taking God's uh, name in vain, keeping the Sabbath, um, um, uh, uh, honoring your your parents really it's it's a total roadmap to a healthy society and, and happiness. You know, if you have the Sabbath, that's joy. That is just plain joy. That's the time with your family. That's the richest, you know, thing in your week. Um, honoring your parents and 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 giving them 
continued uh, support and, and and giving them continued life and and having them around for your children. It's it's just these these things make you wealthy. They make you they make you happy. Um, and and if there's borders around not doing bad things, uh, obviously like murder, you know, it, w w when you or or coveting, you just have these borders and these borders, these boundaries, and these boundaries create a happy fulfilled life so really the ten commandments is a is a, you know you could totally turn it into like simple roadmap for joy in life you would think everybody would want it yeah and it it, it the depth there is extraordinary I, mean, I like to say there's like their ten commandments are simple and deep they're jewish and universal mm -hmm. they're um timely and timeless they're all inclusive but very specific and they're personal and national they're personal and and uh and apply to the, the society as a whole. So they right. have these dimensions that you're saying that make them very accessible and, and an ongoing, what you call an avoda. It's an ongoing spiritual discipline to be able to learn them and fulfill them. And now how do you, how do you recommend, uh, give us, give us a, a practical step as to how to bring that, the consciousness into your life, like, like, okay, you know what, you know, I'm hearing Rabbi Shalom Schwartz. Yes, I, 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 I can, I can see that. That's true, and I haven't put that enough into my mind. Now, now, what, what, what's a? Give me a practical step about how do I, you know, incorporate that more into my daily routine, my daily life. Okay, I have a, a little bit of a way out answer for that. Okay, I mean, okay. The, the, the simple answer is get a book and read it and start doing it. You take our course. Um, you know, in Hebrew, we have some courses. I'm doing podcasts now in, in English, uh, in Hebrew, pardon me, every week, but I hope to start one soon in, he in English. There's, there's Learn about it. That's the simple answer. But I'm going to give mm -hmm. another one that's a little challenging. But I, I think if we're already on that question, I'm going to share something that actually changed my life about two months ago, okay, on this question. Okay. And that's the following. Uh, you know, in the, in the temple, I'm talking about the Mishkat, in the temple, we know from the Mishnah Tamid that the in the Kohanim every day, as part of, and I'm saying this very specifically based on the Talmud Yerushalmi, as part of Kriyat Shema, they said the Ten Commandments. They said the Ten Commandments every day, mm. and there are many Mephoshim that want to say that it wasn't just in the temple, it was part of the service everywhere. What does that mean? So you and, you and I would get up in the morning and we'd say the Ten Commandments, the whole... Ten Commandments it takes about a minute to say all of the, you know, the whole text of the Ten Commandments. It's just a short right. little text, followed by the words, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then the next, right after that, it says, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these things, these things, that I'm commanding you today, you know what that refers to according to the Rishalmi? the Ten uh -huh. Commandments. Mm -hmm. And reading that, directly following, you're supposed to put them on your heart. Teach them right. to your children. Right. When you get up, when you lie down, these are the Ten Commandments that are meant to be constantly in your consciousness. They are the focus of what you teach your children. So if you want to do a daily practice of it, once a day, take out a Bible, read chapter 20, of Exodus, the beginning chapter of 20 in Exodus, it starts with the words, and God spoke all these words saying, and it's the revelation at Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments. And then follow it with the words of the Shema, mm -hmm. which basically reminds you that this is your core values for your day, for your life. Right. And I must tell you, it was I've been working on this for 14 years now. Two months ago when I saw Rav Mordechai spoke about this in one of his books, that you should do this. It mm. changed my life. I do it in wow. the morning. I do it in the evening, and it's a transformative uh, reminder. It, it's a fulfillment, first of all, of uh, what it says in the Bible every day. Take heed, Hishamelecha. Take heed. Don't forget the day you stood at Mount Sinai and you heard my voice, because this is the resonance of God's voice in our lives daily. The Ten Commandments are the echo from Sinai that are meant to awaken what was printed on our souls and printed on our souls then and to bring our consciousness aligned with these core values and our actions and our speech together with it. So the first step is just become familiar with it and 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 doing it once a day, or if you want to do it once a week, whatever, it, it just take the time to read it, meditate right. on it, 
and that'll lead to much many more things. All right, so let's take a little let's take a tiny pause for just one second. I'm gonna open my my studio door here. I'm gonna yell out to Malka and ask her to bring in something special from the kitchen. I tried to WhatsApp her during uh, when you were talking, but I don't know if she saw it. So hold on a second. One second. Malka, can I ask you to bring the Ten Commandments from the kitchen, please? All right. Okay, great. So uh, we are live, though. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's 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 uh, it's a very you're saying read it, read it, learn about it, make it part of your life. Uh, you also have a course uh, on it that uh, people can join. And that is found at aseretglobal.org, uh, A-S-E-R-E-T, aseretglobal.org. And you have a course there. People can join it. You're going to make podcasts in English as well. That's great. And, and Malka just delivered this from the kitchen. This is Beautiful. a Ten Commandments that my father-in-law, Malka's dad, uh, he's a, he is a doctor in Texas. And his hobby is a woodwork, a wood uh, wood burning, wood carving, wood burning, and he made this, and I was just ecstatic about it. This is a nice. beautiful Ten Commandments. Wow, how awesome is that? Really yeah. beautiful. I really love it a lot, and it lives in my kitchen. And and me and, and people who listen to my show, people who listen to my show know that I'm also an advocate of stuff in your life and in your house, physical things that remind you of the land of Israel. <clears throat> I'm always advocating for drinking Friday night wine from the land of Israel uh, and having a poster of a picture that you took in the land of Israel. And I think having a, a, a Ten Commandments jewelry, a Ten Commandments picture, a Ten Commandments magnet in your house, it just reminds you that this that you have a value system, that you have a core value system that you live with, that 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 it's that it that, that you can think about. And then and then you come up with something like this is you know one of my favorite commandments or this is this is something that I'm focusing on right now. Uh, uh, it's it's it it makes a difference. Let's just let's just say hi to some of the folks that have joined us. I think uh, Fernando from Brazil, Shalom. Um Denise says, a joyous Chodesh Tov. That's right, the new month of, of Adar, Adar 1. Uh, uh, Cecile says, God bless all of you from Virginia. And Marilyn, my good friend, says, Shalom from North Carolina. Shalom. And even not so far away, Hananya says, Shalom from Eilat and Chodesh Tov. That's awesome, Hananya. I'm, I'm a little jealous. It's probably nice and warm over there. And so it is in Utah. So shalom from Utah. And down uh, a, a few uh, kilometers down the road is uh, our, uh, our, our one of our, I think, one of our sister states, which is Kurdistan or uh, 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 autonomous Kurdistan, the region in North Iraq. And uh, they have shared a lot with us. I, I wish that relationship would only grow more. So Shirzad uh, Mamsani says shalom from Kurdistan. And I say shalom to you and salam alaikum right back to you. And Lou uh, says, why are the Ten Commandments not said anymore as part of the Shema prayer like you recommended? Why is that? Oh, my let me, gosh. And, and you, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you answer that in just a second. <laughs> but, uh, but just my good friends, uh, Michael and Anna, Anna Marie, they say, I just ordered my Exodus 20 Ten Commandments frame from Zazzle. It comes in on Valentine's Day and we're placed next to our picture that we took in Israel 2020. <laughs> <laughs> The, when the Lopez's want something, they they when they hear something that touches them, they're they're there. They don't they don't they don't they don't they don't chew it over. They get it done immediately. So that's awesome. It's a great idea, and I want a picture of that. I want you to send me a picture. I want you to email me hishayishayfleischer uh, and I want to see that. Uh, and uh, Wendy says shalom from Queens, New York. So folks from all over the world are 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 joining us. And back to Lou's question, if we can, why are the Ten Commandments not said anymore as part of the Shema prayer? I'm currently reading a 120-page doctorate thesis on that question uh, huh. by a fellow named David Matar, who you might know, uh -huh. Nadia Matar's husband. Sure. Uh, and he wrote his uh, doctorate thesis or an MA thesis on this subject. Uh, okay. To, to, to summarize, it wouldn't do justice to it. Let's just say that he, he took it upon himself. It's very tersely dealt with in the Talmud. It's not a subject that is widely understood. There's a couple of theories about when and how it actually got removed and why. Um, 
uh, all I will say is that he does make the case for considering it coming back now at this time as mm -hmm. something that, mm -hmm. you know, we don't do those things lightly, but there are a number of halakhically acceptable ways, which is, like I said, doing it not as part of the formal service, but um, there's Kriyat Shema Alamita. We say the Shema before we go to sleep, famous rabbi known as the Shla Kodosh. That's when he said the Aseret that he brought from, from the book of Deuteronomy before that. Right. Uh, he did it that way, and and we can also do it um, in our uh, before the actual formal service, meaning uh, before Baruch Shamar, if you know what I'm talking about, sure, early part sure. in, the, in the service where we actually have a reference to saying the Shema. You can do it right. there as well. That's where the halachically you'll find it in some sidurim place just before that um, Kabbalat Olma Chut Shemaim, the part where we accept upon ourselves our commitment to our mission through the saying of the Shema. That's, that's right. That's a very good place to say it. And, and and I heard, and I think that's something that changed my life vis-a-vis, <clears throat> -vis, excuse me, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Ten Commandments, was that the Shema phrase, the uh, the initial phrase, Shema Israel, Hashem Elkeinu, Hashem Echad, Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one, is actually a condensed version of the first two commandments. Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, which is the first commandment, Hashem is one, as in one and not divided. It's an against idolatry statement. And so therefore, those two first two commandments, which were heard by the Jewish people at Sinai directly from God, not with the intermediary assistance of Moshe, but rather direct from Mipia Gvura, from, from, from the heavenly voice himself, uh, and they heard those first two commandments, th that is truncated into a phrase, which is, again, a, uh, not only is it a life phrase, which affirms, uh, uh, our, our value system, but it's also an identity phrase. The, the Shema Israel. Like if you know, if you don't know Shema, it's like you're you're you know there's something missing in your in your Judaism. It's like a it's like a, it's like an essential element. And as I tell the story every time, my my, my wife's grandfather when he was laying in, in a ditch in a death camp uh, uh, on the day of the Russian uh, liberation of the camp, uh, uh, an officer came up to him and said, "Ich bin a Yid. I am a Jew." Shema Yisrael. That's what he said to him. Shema Yisrael is, was his way to say, I am a Jew. And that encapsulates that first phrase, the, the, the first two commandments, which is really out of the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments are the essential ones. I am God. There's no other God before me. And, and, and the, rest, the rest is, 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 is commentary on that, you know, on, on those two. And that's why we heard it direct from the boss himself. He, he gave us that, that, um, uh, th that uh, communication. Rabbi Shalom Schwartz, I feel like we could talk for a lot much longer, but uh, uh, sadly, time is up. Uh, I do want everybody to please visit uh, the website, which is, uh, I'm bringing it up here, which is aseretglobal.org. Uh, and there's really cool, there's an online course here that you can go to, and there it, there it is. Uh, you could put together your own group. There's sessions, there's booklets. Uh, and you could just fill out your name here and and uh, and start the the, the uh uh, the course, and there's also courses and curricula for schools, and that's very important uh, for day schools and for other people. And I have a feeling that there's people listening to to this right now who are going to want to sign up for this course. So it's an excellent, excellent opportunity, Rabbi. I want to thank you. Is there is there any last uh, parting words that you have for us, a story or anything else? You know, I, I have a little story that it's a little. It's on one of my favorite commandments, which is the fifth commandment. To honor your parents you know we all you mentioned how uh, i also grew up in an age where I, a lot of my friends started calling their parents by their first names and, hmm. and it, you know it was, a, it was a situation where and and i remember being at one of the schools in israel one of the most touching moments we have in the program that you run in israel was when we do a parents and children evening for um for the ten commandments project and we bring them together and the parents actually exchange notes with each other. The kid writes what I appreciate about my parent. The child, the parent writes things that they want their children to know about their values, and they exchange these notes. And I can't tell you how I cry every time I watch this. They, you know, they they they're reading this, tears are coming, they hug each other. It's just one of those moments. And um at one of these sessions, though, one of the fathers stood up and said, you know, I don't, I don't get this stuff. You know, you're supposed to really honor everybody equally. I don't want my parents, my kids to honor me specially. And I, you know, there was sort of silence in the room and there's a little ambivalence about what he was saying. 
but uh, this week I, I saw an interview with Tom Brady, who just retired from football, uh, the quarterback. You know, so he he actually was interviewed, and, and out of the blue, there's this kid that asked him the question. He said, "Mr. Brady, you know, you're the hero of millions of people and millions of kids, and tell me, who's your hero?" And you see Tom Brady sort of, he said, well, that, that's a good question. And he's pondering it, and he comes back, and he looks at the camera, and you see a little tear dropping from his eyes, and he said, my dad, my dad is my hero. And it was just such a profound moment. Here is this fellow who's, you know, he's revered by, because he can throw a football, and he's, but he's clearly got something besides that. But his hero is his father. And, and we want to ask ourselves, how do we act in ways that we're heroes to our children? How do we parent in such ways and that we can actually create that dynamic? We don't like to be our children's heroes. So somebody asked me that question, and I, I said, you know, on some level, it's if your children are your hero, if you really respect them and see their potential, they're more likely to, to reflect that back to you. So the point being that there's a lot of dimensions to all of this. But in some ways, it boils down to how we want to live our lives, that we can be really a guide for our children, for our societies, for our families, and, and for ultimately for the Jewish people becoming the kind of nation that will be a light unto the nations. And it, and it comes down to some simple principles, 10 of them, in fact. And if you review them and live them, we'll realign ourselves with that purpose that we are entrusted with at Mount Sinai. Rabbi Shalom Schwartz, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you are the, one of the Talmide Muvhakim, the, 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 a deep student of Rabbi Noah Weinberg from Aish. Uh, you uh, uh, were in charge of Aish Toronto for a long time, and, uh, and a Russian Aish here in the land of Israel developed it. Uh, today you are part of this uh, amazing project to bring the Ten Commandments into general consciousness. Uh, I recommend everybody check out uh, the website, which is aseretglobal.org. Uh, and I want to thank you. And I'm going to myself take upon myself a more um, uh, daily and didactic uh, study and, and appreciation and love for the Ten Commandments. And I'm sure that when you just put that on your heart, uh, it's uh, it starts to to grow and be and be a thing that uh, that brings life, joy, morality uh, into our personal lives, our national lives, and hopefully our global lives as well. Rabbi Shalom, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. So well put. All right, folks, uh, there's Rabbi Shalom. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, it was great being with you. I want to send you a lot of blessings. Uh, Allison says, uh, she says, thanks to you both. And, uh, and Brian Feinstein says, Lech le shalom. be blessed and go in peace. And all the other folks, I want to send you blessings uh, from the land of Israel to all of you for a great, uh, a great Shabbat and a happy new month. Uh, and thank you for all the global friends that have joined us today. And thank you to uh, these platforms that allow us to speak about this. This is this is when we've just we've just sent the cleaning agent through the pipes when we talk about the Ten Commandments uh, through the internet. We just cleansed so much and made this whole thing worth it. Uh, that that God was like, this is what I this is why I made the internet. This is why I made the communications revolution so we could share the 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 word of God. The Seret Adibot, the Ten Commandments from the land of Israel, from because from Zion shall flow forth, shall come forth Torah. So God bless you guys. And Wendy says, she says, thank you so much for this great blessing. Absolutely. And Lou says, great interview. Uh, and that's it. That's all we got to do, except for uh, staying strong out there. And if you're listening on the podcast, we'll be back with Table Torah uh, right after this. And if you're here with me live, then God bless you and Shalom. All right, folks, you are listening to the Ishai Fleischer Show. We're back. It's been a long show. We're going to wrap it up soon. We're going to do a little table Torah. Before we do that, let's just thank the good folks that make this show happen, which is uh, Lou, Moshe, Moshe Herman, Ben Bresky, Tabitha, Yo Uh They get the show out to the world, and we thank them so much. Uh, they really make this uh, they make the show happen, and they're awesome, and they're a great team. So that's... Uh, Yocheved and Tabitha and Moshe Herman and Ben Bresky and Lou. Lots of folks make this show happen. And, of course, you make the show happen when you're part of it, when you're listening to it. And, of course, if you feel like uh, donating and buying a cup of coffee, it's fun. 
It's a fun feeling. Leaves me leave me a little nice message there, which is buy me a coffee dot uh, com forward slash yeshai. Uh, I also want to thank some of our sponsors, Hebronfund.org, the Hebron Jewish community survives through the support of uh, the international uh, uh, lovers of the Abrahamic way. And uh, they, the folks of Hebron, they are the defenders of the tomb, the patriarchs, the matriarchs, uh, the forefathers and mothers. And you could support them through Hebronfund.org. And uh, another fun way to support your favorite folks in Israel is through uh, the incredible deliciousness that is uh, Prohibition Pickle. And I cannot tell you how delicious that salami and vodka that uh, Chaim brought me. Uh, and soon it was. And soon he's going to have a great new website. In the meantime, you can check out Prohibition Pickle on Instagram and on Facebook. And you can order stuff for your favorite uh, folks that are here in Israel to make your to make Shabbat so special and awesome. Uh, and that's uh, Chaim at Prohibition Pickle. Uh, then we have uh, many other good friends. Um we're soon going to be joining the JNS.org family. This show is going to be joining the JNS uh, Jewish News Syndicate uh, family, and I'm very excited about that. So check out their website and also JewishPress.com, who put out a great email called the Jewish Express. Uh, they are doing great work and uh, putting, giving you true, true vision of uh, of what's happening here, and not a warped uh, 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 leaning of a bias of anti-Israelism that you get in some. News uh, news sites as well. Uh, there are other folks that sponsor the show, uh, but in, in, I, I'm out of time, and I just want to thank all of them. Our number one sponsor is the Kodesh Baruch Hu, Hashem, uh, Hashem God Almighty, uh, and we are part of the Land of Israel Network, which is located uh, here in Judea in this beautiful farm, uh, the the Arugot Farm, brainchild of Ari Brownwitz and Jeremy Kimpel, just incredible, and, and their amazing families, amazing wives. Uh, and it's just a, a, a spiritual uh, a retreat of unparalleled, unparalleled proportions, and I'm not exaggerating. It's just something that you come there and your spirit is taken out, just taken to a higher place, higher, uh, higher level. Uh, so, of course, when you're booking your trip, and I can't wait until I see you here in the land of Israel soon, as trips are going to be coming back soon and, and tourism is opening up. Now let's get to uh, Table Torah a little bit. We have a Torah portion, as I said before, which is called Truma, uh, which is all about the blueprint of the tabernacle, the beginnings of the blueprint of the tabernacle. And inside this Torah portion, which is filled with blueprint, is actually one of the most central and important verses in the whole Torah. I dare say that this verse is, in some ways, the central verse of the whole Bible. Yes, it is shocking but it is in Parsha Truma this week. And all you have to do is say this verse over and over again, like a mantra. And, and you, and you'll see in a second why, because this verse is in many ways, the ultimate purpose verse. You ask why God created the world. And he says, in order to bring my presence into this world and to share my presence with humanity. And the verse is chapter 25 verse Eight, ve'asu li mikdash ve'shachanti betocham, and they shall make for me a holy place, a sanctuary, and I will dwell within them. Boom, that's it. That's the big verse. I will. They will make for me. They, the humanity, Israel, will make for me a sanctuary, a holy place. And therefore, I will dwell within them. There's a simple double meaning of this verse, which is if you make yourself into a holy vessel, God will dwell within you. Vasuli Mikdash, if they make themselves into a temple, Vashakanti Bituchaim, I'll dwell within them. So God will dwell within the individual person, you who's listening to this right now. You could be a vessel for a temple for God's presence. And the same thing is true for the home. Make the home a holy place. God will be there. Make your ears listen to holiness of a, of a podcast talking about Torah. Boom, it's in your head. Now God is living in your head. And Israel, the state of, the, the or the land of, be a vessel. And God will be drawn into you 
and then out through you to the world. And then we're making the globe into a vessel for godliness. And of course, the ultimate expression of that is the temple itself. But as you can, you can, you can see, it, it, is a, it, is, it is just a master vessel. But all the other vessels, the, the mind, the brain, the heart, these things are unparalleled brilliance. It's impossible to, to understand what a, what a gift the brain and the heart are and the rest of our body. And, and if, you just, if you just allow yourself, you could become a, a channel for godliness. And if you allow yourself, you could, you could easily push God, God, godliness away. It's not that hard to do that. A little image here, a little image there, a little bad word here, a little bad word there. Boom, you could easily uh, push it out. In any case, uh, consider what I'm saying, that this may be the very, very most central verse in the whole Torah, which is, which is really the purpose of man and the gift of God's presence in our lives. And now I want to get to uh, my last point for kind of a table Torah for something that you could say over at the table, which is that um, we, ha- we have a whole Torah portion filled with icons, and you know what? Different icons work for different people. When I say icons, of course, I mean it, godly images um, like uh, the the tabernacle uh, or like the altar, uh, like the, the showbread. And I'm sure there's somebody listening out there which, like, they meditate on the showbread table. But I, I think that we can usually agree that the one of the most iconic of them all, there's, there's the Ark of the Covenant, right? There's the Ark of the Covenant, there's the Ark of the Covenant, which is, uh, 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 you know, those cherubs and the wings uh, uh, and, and God's voice coming between them. That, that's at the end of the Parsha. So that's super iconic. But I think we can agree that the most iconic of them all is the menorah. And the menorah is, is uh, the directions to make a menorah is given in this week's Torah portion. Uh, and it says, Vasita menorah zahav, make a menorah zahav. Tehora, mikshata semenora, make it from one piece of gold um, and six um, six uh, candelabras coming in from a central one. Now, when you read it, if you didn't know what you were looking at, then you, you wouldn't be able to really replicate it or make it happen from the words. And the last verse about the menorah says, Ure'e ve'ase betavnitam asherata mar'e bahar. And see and make in the, in the fashion that you are shown here on the mountain. And Moses uh, was given a vision of the menorah and, and was asked to copy it. However, Rashi says that God, that Moses did not have an easy time understanding it until God showed him a vision of menorah in fire, a menorah in fire. And uh, I ask and consider you to ask, why a menorah in fire? Why not a menorah, a picture, a JPEG? And I came up with some answers, three answers specifically. Why, why did God show him a menorah of fire and not a menorah of uh, just a regular menorah? Like what, what was the extra fire part for? So here's three quick teachings about why a menorah of fire. Um, one, there may come a time where they cart away your menorah and take it to Rome. There may come a time where uh, your temple is going to be destroyed. So I just want you to know that the original menorah was not down there, but it's up here with me. It's a menorah in fire. And it's going to continue to shine, shine bright. It's going to continue to give off heat and warmth. And you Jewish people, even if you don't have the menorah down there, just know that the original copy is with me up in heaven. It's a heavenly, fiery menorah. And it can never go out. And nobody could ever cart it away, just so you know that. And there's a heavenly Jerusalem which is w- waiting to be populated uh, when you guys populate the lower Jerusalem. So that's number one, which is there's a heavenly fiery menorah and it's always there. And you don't have to worry uh, that, that you, know, you don't have it, you will have it, and my original one, nothing can touch it. That's number one. Number two, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a historical, you know, long-term faith type vision. The second one is more practical in our lives. We think that, that, that we yearn to like light our personal menorahs in our life. We think we have to get to the top and, and light those candles. But God says to you, guess what? You thought that only the top was lit? Just so you know, the body's also lit. What does that mean? It means that like all of your efforts are valuable. All of the path until you get to the top is also lit up. All of our small steps... They're also counted in our, in our long, 
the gift of our long lives. Like along the way, everything you're doing, that's also lighting the menorah. It's not just an end game. And, and Jewish history is not just an end game. It's not all about just get to Mashiach. Oh my gosh, if we could just get that, then we'll be done. No, it's all the good steps along the way. It's all the chesed, all the kindness along the way. And so it's not just the top that's lit. It's the whole body. It's, it's, it's the path. Not not the end product, which is uh, which is what Judaism is about. So so lesson number two is really uh, about uh, how to serve God in joy through the efforts, through the long through the long road, uh, and all of it is lit along the way. So the first one was kind of national historic, and the second one is more kind of personal and and faith, and the third one is pedagogical. I think that maybe God taught Moses something about what happens when you ask a question. So Moses is like a student, and he's like, I don't get it, I don't understand. Can you please explain to me how to do a menorah? So God's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the answer, but I'm also going to teach you about how to teach. When you're, when you're a student, like you are a student of mine right now, when, you come, when a student comes to you, and they're going to ask you a question, the answer should be an answer of fire. Show them the passion of Judaism. Don't answer them in a cold way. Yeah, technically we do this, we do this. Give them the fire. Show them what it's about. So he says, oh, you want an answer? I'll give you an answer. But the answer is an answer of fire. There's there's esh. There's excitement. There's heat. And not just a perfunctory uh, legalisms. And those are important. The law is mucho important. But there's something which is broader, which is deeper around it. And you've got you've to share and communicate that passion. So those are the, I think, three lessons of uh, the menorah of fire. Uh, let's go through it again very quickly, which is the first one is that there's a menorah in heaven and it's never, it's never going to be extinguished. And two is that the path, the long path along the way, is just as important as the end goal. It's also lit. And thirdly, when we teach our children, we teach them with excitement and we, and we thereby uh, pass the long chain we can, we can pass it from generation to generation and excite the next generation uh, about the great story of the Jewish people. And, and that's, that's one of our great missions is to keep passing it on. Folks, you are listening to the Ishai Fleischer Show. Thank you for joining me on this uh, long podcast. Uh, I want to thank all of you folks uh, for, for being out there and being strong. Thanks to Malka Fleischer for joining me uh, in the beginning of the show. Thank you, Hashem, for the great gift. Thank you to the awesome uh, listeners and friends around the world. Please write me an email, yishai at yishaifleischer.com. Love to hear from you. Check out uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash yishai uh, for a little bit of lovings, a little bit of sharings. And, uh, and with that, I send you my blessings for an excellent week and a chodesh tov. And may we be happy and strong. 60 days of only joy. That's our challenge this, this uh, uh, starting today. And if you missed the day, don't worry about it. Just keep going strong. 60 days of joy. And may all of our troubles and travails fade away. And we see a great time and a great revelation. And we're living in an awesome time of revelation. Thank you, Hashem, for every moment. God bless you. Stay strong. Stay connected. Stay tuned. More great stuff is on the way. And shalom. The world, says Albert Einstein, is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. And I say that one thing you can always do is tell the tale. So I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.